Welcome to Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. Get to John, hang a right. Gosh, we got so many people that are traveling right now. <laughs> wow. Traveling and sick. Um, we need to remember to lift those up in prayer that are, are sick. There's quite a few, actually, something's been going around, so. Is everybody there? Yeah. Um, and John mentioned the uh, uh, Thursday morning men's breakfast and Bible study and also the Tuesday morning. Uh, this coming week, we will not be having those things since it is Christmas week and a lot of people are going to be traveling. Um, but we'll pick it back up the following week. Also, we will not have a Wednesday evening service uh, this Wednesday, but we will obviously pick it back up the coming Sunday. So um, hopefully we'll be able to, to continue into Acts chapter 8 the next Sunday if I can make it through chapter 7. <laughs> In four weeks. Wow, we've been here for a long time. All right, so the teaching application verse for this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse 10. In the New Living Translation, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for... Uh, speaking to us. I thank you for, for what you have to say to us this morning through your word. Um, I ask that you would open up our hearts to receive from you. Open up uh, your word to our hearts. Lord, we lift up to you those that are, are sick right now. Um, there's this flu thing that's going around. We just ask that you to heal those who are sick, Lord. And uh, Father, also that you would just uh, bless us this morning with a wonderful word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you know, I expected us to get further than we actually did last week in Acts 7. Um, I, th- I guess I got a little wordy, went off on some rabbit trails. We didn't get quite as far as I had anticipated. So we're going to finish up, hopefully, chapter 7 today. And we're going to be picking it up, if I remember correctly, around verse 37. Now, what's been going on here in our chapter is Stephen has been presenting the Sanhedrin, also called the Council, with what would have been his defense but is in reality a review of the history of Israel from the time of Abraham all the way to the time of Moses, highlighting for those in the Sanhedrin, the council, and those that were there for this this trial, so to speak, uh, highlighting for them the pattern in Israel, or of Israel, in rejecting God's chosen men, God's chosen saviors, rebelling against God. Now, his speech does this while drawing their attention to the faithfulness of God despite Israel's continued faithlessness toward God themselves. So at the same time, as as him telling this, Stephen was pointing out to them that God appeared to Abraham, he appeared to Moses, despite the absence of there being a tabernacle or there being a temple. Now, you know, we could could look at the council, we could look at the Sanhedrin here as if they were just uh, thick-skulled and couldn't get the point, But in a way, you know, this is a lot like, and and this is kind of a self-deprecating comment, but this is kind of a lot like a church service that's going on here uh, with Stephen and the council. You know, um, it's it's a group of people assembled listening to teaching, and they had a choice then of receiving it or not. And we obviously, all of us together here this morning, as God speaks to us through his word, we have the option ourselves of receiving it or not receiving it. Now, sometimes we sometimes we need to be reminded of something. Perhaps we're, we're aware of something, and, and we hear a point, and we've heard it several times, but again, we need to be reminded of it again because we have forgotten or we have gotten off the path or, or something along those lines. Sometimes we 
need to feel conviction over something that we've got involved in that we should not be involved in. Sometimes we need to be encouraged with a reminder of God's faithfulness. You know, so this is kind of like a, a mini church service here, although uh, nobody in the church except for the one teaching is a, <laughs> is a believer. Hopefully that's not the case here this morning. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not. But, uh, but this is kind of like a church service that, that we're seeing here. So we're going to pick up with verse 37. And that says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him ye shall hear. Now, if they had not received Stephen's point or had not understood Stephen's points through this this whole teaching that he's been giving them so far, they very well should have at this moment because Stephen, at this point in time, is certainly not beating around the bush. Stephen reminds them with this one sentence here, Stephen reminds them of a couple of things. That there was a greater than Moses who would be coming. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons. The first being uh, because the council elevated Moses higher than than they should have. Uh, He was a great man of God, don't get me wrong, but Moses was only able to deliver the law to Israel. And that leads into the second reason that it, it, it took another man, you know, Joshua, to lead Israel into the promised land. As we were reminded of this past Wednesday in Numbers 13, Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yahushua. You know, that, that means God is salvation. And Jesus' name in Hebrew was the shortened version of Joshua. Uh, that is a clear picture uh, to us of the fact that the law cannot lead us into the promised land. Only our Savior, only the Savior Jesus can do that. Now, the next reminder that Stephen gave them in verse 37 was that Moses himself said that God would raise up after him a prophet greater than he. And Israel would need to take care to listen to him. Now, Moses was speaking of the Messiah to come, and he was saying to Israel that that God would send his Messiah, and they needed to hear him. The prophet that Moses spoke of, that was Jesus, the one who they were rejecting. Now, twice in Deuteronomy 18, Moses speaks of the Messiah to come. The first time in verse 15, the second time he speaks of this prophet, the the Messiah to come, is in verse 18. Now, we've talked about this before, the the rabbinical teaching method that is called remez, in in which uh, one scripture would be mentioned by the teacher uh, with the expectation that the people that were listening, receiving the teaching, would, would be able to, would have enough knowledge of Scripture that, that that would remind them of the rest, what the rest of that Scripture says. And so I think Stephen was employing that here and expecting that the council would remember um, when he mentions the first time that Moses brings up the prophet to come, they would remember the second time in that same chapter in Deuteronomy that, that, that Moses mentions him. Now that time... Moses says this in Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 18. He says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that that Stephen intended for them to think of this second mention that Moses made of the prophet to come. And so that they also understood the implication that God would hold them accountable for their rejection of Jesus. This echoes, interestingly enough, this echoes what what Peter had had said to the same council twice before, first in Acts chapter 4 and then in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 30, it says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand (coughs) to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now the prophet that Moses had spoken of was the very one that they had put to death and whom God has exalted to his right hand as initiator of life and Savior. But that warning, you know, is not only for the council. You know, it's, it's for everyone uh, today who is rejecting Jesus. Now, I find it interesting 
the, the kind of rift that we hear among people regarding uh, whether or not to receive Jesus um, in, in popular culture today. You know, we typically hear, well, um, you know, Christians are, are, are lemmings. They're just, just following, following, and, and you know, they're, they're just blindly doing this. And, and, and uh, we also hear that, that you know, be, be, don't, don't be a part of the crowd. You know, be original. Don't be Christian. Don't. The interesting thing about that is that the crowd are the ones who are rejecting Jesus. We see over and over again in Scripture how when Jesus is rejected, it's often the crowd that is rejecting him and the individuals, the smaller groups that are receiving him. So, you know, that saying, don't, be, don't go with the crowd being original, you know, that, that's often a line that someone says to someone else who, who, to convince them that they don't need Jesus. Live a little. You know, there's, there's another line. Life ends with Christ. Life ends with Christianity. You know, that, that's kind of that baited hook that reels people into choosing death and rejecting life. You know, we, need, we need to be careful of wanting to be a part of the crowd because as we've seen, as we've studied through the Old Testament so far, as we've seen the crowd are the ones that are trying to get back into Egypt. That's interesting to me that in Acts 5 when Peter calls Jesus Prince and Savior, the literal word that's translated Prince, it means initiator of life. And it's a reference back to Peter's earlier statement to the council that they had killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead. Jesus is the author of life. And yet, you know, fuddy-duddy Christians over the years have given people the impression that life ends after Christ. Meaning that, that life turns from fun to drudgery after one receives Jesus. But the reality is that life begins with Christ. There's something that's, that's missing in a lot, of, a lot of lives of Christians, and that's joy. You know, a lot, a lot of people are just missing that joy. And, and Jesus was joyful. Think about, you know, like Jesus had crowds following him around, and, and crowds don't follow sour, dour people. You know, Jesus was joyful. The Bible tells us that we're to be Christ-like, and if we're to be Christ-like, then we should also be joyful. John 17, 13, Jesus said, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I don't think any of us would argue that Jesus manifested all the fruits of the Spirit in his life. Well, guess what? One of those fruits of the Spirit is joy. And so we should also have joy in our lives, and we should be joyful and not constantly looking at the things that are wrong, but, but focusing on things that are good, you know, and enjoying those things. God, God wants us to be joyful, and he wants us to enjoy his blessings in our lives. Contrary to what, what some Christians think, discouragement is not a spiritual gift, and grouchiness is not a fruit of the Spirit. You know, we, we, don't have, we shouldn't have to be play-acting joy either. You know, let's not have any play-acting. Jesus' joy sprung out of his intimate relationship with his Father, his relationship with the Spirit, and from his awareness of God's purposes. Philippians 2.5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the same attitude that Jesus had. And because Jesus sacrificed himself for us, we can have the same attitude that he had, knowing that by him we are made perfect, we are complete, we are righteous and strong, lacking nothing but abiding in all good things. There's a good example in Scripture of a man who thought uh, the joy of life was found in the world. And he couldn't understand that abundant life is not in an abundance of the world. That man was, was a, a rich young ruler who asked Jesus what he needed to do to have eternal life. In Mark 10, 21, Jesus responded to him, says Jesus loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Now to a worldly mind, that sounds like Jesus wanted him to live a miserable life. 
Yet Jesus says that he came to bring abundant life. The world says abundant life comes in the abundance of stuff. Yet the cross of Christ demands that we put down our burdens that we can carry the cross. You know, stuff doesn't make life. Stuff, more often than not, just makes a mess. God makes life. And when we get distracted from the joy of being in Christ, we accumulate a mess. And when that happens, God in His grace rocks our world so that those things fall to the ground and we can focus on Him. Now, have you ever thought about this? The, the theories of the world. Um, the things that, that uh, deny God as creator. The Big Bang Theory. Uh, the theory of evolution. These things, they boil down to the worship of stuff because those theories mean that stuff is all we've got. Only God says all we need is Him. For His people, it's, it's not a matter of survival of the fittest. It's instead a matter of surrendering to Him. And we don't have to strive for stuff. Instead, we can abide in Christ, and we can have great joy doing that. In Acts 27, when Paul was on board a ship headed for Rome, a great storm struck, and the boat was, was being torn asunder in the storm, and, and the crew was throwing off all the stuff that they had brought with them so that they could make the ship more abundant. And the crew were, were going to then, after, after they had thrown all the stuff off, the ship was still sinking. They were going to abandon the ship. They were going to leave the ship themselves. And Paul stopped them. He said, unless they abide in the boat, they would be lost. That's a very interesting picture there of our abiding in Christ. You know, it's much easier to abide in Christ during the storm when we're willing to let go of stuff. Whether that's job, finances, toys, gadgets, opinions, or arguments. And that's a good thing because most of the time, all those things that we want to carry around, those things just crowd out God. First Timothy, uh, First John 2, starting at verse 15, it says, Love of the world squeezes out love of the Father. Now that's my paraphrase of it. You know, by the grace of God, sometimes the doors that he opens for us are narrow so that we can't enter with all our baggage. And when we drop our baggage at the door, we find that what had been buried underneath is joy. The council here, they couldn't, they couldn't hear the message because they interpreted Scripture based on their opinions instead of letting Scripture speak for itself. In the lives of the council members, their opinions were louder than Scripture. And because of it, they could not get the message. There used to be, a, on television, there used to be a, a great stain cleaning commercial. I want to play that for you guys real quick because it illustrates a point really well. So tell me about yourself. Well, you know, an organized person, somebody who does not need details. Ouch. I'm actually very, very good with groups. Mm -hmm. I've surprised all my goals, my previous position, my prior job, and your competitor. My personality and me have surpassed their own goals. <laughs> Get famous at mytalkingstain.com. So tell me about yourself. No, you know, I'm See, opinions are like that stain. They're always want to be louder than the truth. Opinions that we place higher than Scripture, and they're just like that coffee stain. They jumble up the message. And the council, they, they refuse to hear what Stephen clearly told them from Scripture, being that they were so distracted by their opinions, having closed ears, having stiff necks, and having hard hearts. Proverbs chapter 26, verse, starting with verse 12, says, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Men who are perishing are, are wise in their own eyes. But true wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. So the truth was presented to the council, and they wouldn't receive it. There, there will come a time 
when the gospel presentation that, that, that we hear over and over again, there will come a time when that gospel presentation is the last one that we hear. And we don't know what lies in store for us tomorrow. Wiser people than us have made life-ending mistakes. So don't allow your heart to, to grow hard toward the things of the Lord. You know, as you're hearing the gospel over and over again, if you haven't received it before, don't continue to reject it. Don't continue to reject Jesus. Don't continue to reject the Savior. Don't reject Jesus. You know, it doesn't help you one bit to know that Jesus is the Savior unless you make him your Savior. It has to be a personal choice. And of course, as I, as I nearly always do, I'll give that opportunity at the end of the message today. Verse 38 says, This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. Saying to Aaron, Make us gods to be before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Like Jesus, Moses led the congregation of Israel. And like Jesus, Moses had a special relationship with God. And, gave, and God gave him revelation. And so Moses not only spoke of Jesus, but he prefigured Jesus. And Israel's rejection of Moses, that prefigured Israel's rejection of Jesus. In verse 38, where Stephen called Israel a congregation... It's that, that word, ekklesia. We've talked about that word before. Greek word, ekklesia. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean church in the sense that most people think of the word church. You know, a building where people go to fellowship, to sing hymns, to read the Bible, to learn about God, and, and to pretend they have no problems. I'm just I'm kidding about that last one. I hope we don't need to pretend with one another, do we? But ecclesia, it means called out. And in reference to Israel, it means they were called out of Egypt by God for a particular purpose. Now the Bible says that the purpose for Israel's being called out was to be a light to the nations of the world. But instead of being a light, Israel chose to go the way of other nations, choosing idolatry, even creating for themselves a golden calf, even as Moses was receiving the law from God. Their rejection of Moses was their rejection of God. Because God had ordained Moses. And because they rejected God, he gave them up to worship the idols that they desired to worship. Now, ecclesia, it carries with it two ideas. That of being called out, as well as that of being assembled together. Now, in relation to the church, we are called out and we are brought together for the purpose of glorifying God and spreading the gospel message. In his first epistle, Peter put it this way, in 1 Peter 2. He said, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are, built up, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are all individual stones that make up that called out assembly, or the ecclesia, the church. Each one of us fits together in special and unique ways. We're all chiseled out of the world by our same confession of Jesus. Chiseled by the creator of the universe, who is continuing to chisel to conform us to the image of Christ. 
Now, that chiseling is, is very rarely fun for us. It involves the removal of parts and pieces that most of, most of the time we thought that we needed. But the removal of those pieces is very important if we are to fit together in an assembly that is glorifying to God. We all have pieces that need to be chiseled away, and God is doing that work. But it is a process. And we can have faith that God is going to complete his work, and we can stand together on the firm foundation of his grace in that process. Now, the chiseling that is done is not a work that we can do of our own hands. It's a work that can only be accomplished by the hand of God. Now, chiseling, of course, that means things fall to the wayside. Things fall to the ground. And God expects that we leave those things behind, not that we turn around and try and pick those things back up. And they may be things, again, that we thought we needed, that, that were important to us, that were a part of us. But we need to let those pieces go. You know, I, I'm amazed these days when I, I walk through a mall or wherever and I look in the, the, the windows of the uh, clothing, various clothing stores, and see things that, that people were wearing in the 80s. You know, these things are coming back. And I'm, I'm like shocked. You know, seriously, leg warmers? Really? I mean, they're, they're out there. And I think back to, to in my own life. You know, there was, there was a period of my life when I, I dressed a particular way, particular way and I looked a particular way. You know, and, but, but now, if I tried to go back and wear those same things, I would look ridiculous. Obviously, I didn't look ridiculous then. I looked cool, right? <laughs> At least in my own eyes. I may have tried to go back and put those things on before. <laughs> You know, but it, it, it's a good, it's, a, you know, making myself an illustration here, but I guess it's a good illustration of the fact that, that some things, you know, God chisels off and you just, they're not you. You know, you, don't, you have no business trying to put those things back on. You need to walk away and let them go. The 80s need to go. <laughs> they need to be behind us. Now, in verse 41... The phrase regarding Israel, they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. That is key to understanding what Stephen wants the council to understand. You see, the golden calf was a work of their own hands, just as all idols are created things. And so Israel in, in the wilderness rejected God, preferring to worship the work of their own hands. One of the accusations against Stephen was that he had blasphemed the temple. And he was accused of this because he called them out on their worship of the temple. Just as Israel had gone into idolatry in the wilderness, so Israel was now in idolatry, worshiping the temple instead of God, the God of the temple. Now, it seems to me today that, that we are seeing an escalation of idolatry, uh, even in, in, in Christians. In a lot of ways, we, we do see church worship. I, you know, do a, go online and do a Google search for, for best church building. And, and you will find top 10, top 20, top 50 lists of the best church buildings in the world. Do a gurgle, a gurgle, do a Google search. <laughs> do a Google search for best church body. And have your safe search filter on when you do that, because <laughs> you don't know what's going to pop up there. But do, a, do a, a search for best church body or best church congregation, and you won't have hardly any hits. You know, you'll, you'll get books geared at, at how to grow a church. You'll also get Christian auto, auto body repair shops. But I think that that shows us that, that in, in a way, um, the viewpoint of Christians about church has kind of gotten bent. It's kind of gone sideways. You know, the, the fact that, that we're so interested in the church building. Is it a good church building? What do they offer at the church building? Will they have uh, coffee ready for me when I come in? Will their, their bookstore carry 
perf purpose-driven life? Or, or will it carry uh, the Left Behind series? Will it carry all these other things? Will it have everything I need? Will it have all the comforts that I'm looking for? And, and, and great church buildings, that's not a bad thing. And having comforts in the church, that's not a bad thing. But when we start to, to put those things above the growth of Christians in the church and worshiping God and loving God, you know, that's, when it gets bent, that's when it gets bent and it gets wrong. You know, often the church body or the body of believers, when, when there is idolatry in that kind or when, when the focus is on the wrong thing, the church building or the, the comforts within the church, um, then the believers become very disjointed and, and they're, they're left starving for the word. And there's also the issue of, of denominational identification becoming almost foremost before uh, identification with Jesus. You know, sometimes, and I've, I've noticed this, I've picked up on this over the years, that if you ask someone if they're a Christian, a lot of times somebody will respond, well, I'm Presbyterian. Well, I didn't ask that. <laughs> I said, are you a Christian? I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. I'm, well, that's, that's great, but are you a Christian? Now, I think that reveals that there is some identity confusion among Christians resulting in an identification with a church or identification uh, with something over identification with Christ. Now, the point is that, that like many of the, the Jews of, of that day, many Christians have, have started worshiping the church rather than worshiping God. And it is possible to take those things that, that are a means of worshiping God and, and, and elevating and lifting up God and, and place them at the level of God. And we need to be careful not to do that. Verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? And it's interesting that even as they rejected God, they still had the tabernacle and later the temple. And so we see that those things did not keep them from rejecting God. They were given to them by God as a means for them to make their sacrifices, for them to worship Him, but the system and the structure had become greater to them than God. I think sometimes we make the false conclusion that if we go to the church that has all the programs and all of the ministries, we will be kept in a closer relationship with God. Now, there's nothing wrong with programs and ministries per se, as long as they are spirit-led rather than works of the flesh. But our relationship with God should be a personal one upon which these other things become conduits for the full expression of that relationship. Israel had things turned upside down. They began to believe that they were special to God because of their temple, their sacrifices, their worship. They forgot that God gave them the temple, God gave them the sacrificial system, and God gave them the means by which they could worship Him not because, or because they were special to him. See, they got, it, they got it turned around. We serve and desire to please God because we are Christians. We're not Christians because we serve and please God. If that were the case, then our salvation would be based on works. But because our salvation is based on the work of Christ, Rather than our own works, we are able to serve God and please God because we are made acceptable to God through Christ. 
The fact is that without Christ, we cannot please God. Many people have done some great and wonderful works, selfless works. You know, there, there are atheists that give lots and lots to, to charities and different philanthropic works. You know, think of Bill Gates. You know, he does, he, he gives a lot of money to, to different charities and different works. And he's an atheist. Warren Buffett, he's an atheist. And he gives lots and lots of money to different works. But because they have not done the first work of accepting Jesus, no matter how good their works may be, they cannot be pleasing to God. Sin taints everything. Those, those works are, as the Bible says, like filthy rags before the Lord. It's a deception and a trap of Satan that any person believes their works can be pleasing and acceptable in the eyes of God apart from Christ. In the case of, of many atheists, you know, there is that mentality that they can have the best of both worlds. They can live as they choose to live now, and if when they, they pass, they discover that, oh, there is God, well, then they've got their good works to cover them. But it doesn't work that way. The Bible tells us that, that works will burn if they are not righteous, and righteous works cannot be done but upon a saving relationship with Christ. So it's a great deception then that somebody believes that they can live as they want now and do many, many good works and then be accepted by God later. But, you know, Christians, we were talking about atheists, Christians can also get things turned upside down and believe that, that our relationship with God is dependent on good works instead of our good works coming out of our relationship with God. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, the Christians in Galatia, he wrote in Galatians 3.3, 3, he said, How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Our relationship with God should never be dependent on programs and ministries. But our relationship with God is most certainly benefited by taking part in programs and ministries. We can have all the programs and ministries that, that we want, but if we are participating in them as if those things are our relationship with God, at that point we have made programs and ministries into idols. Instead, those things should spring forth out of our personal relationship with Christ. You know, I, I like to say, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Christ. Everything else is just second, from denominational lines to opinions about, uh, about different Christian events and things, to a kosher diet, to, to uh, Sabbath worship, I mean, worshiping on the Sabbath. Instead, let, let's, let's continue to make little of ourselves, and let's make much of Jesus. Because Jesus is in the business of transforming lives not to mention changing hearts and minds. Opinions about non-salvation issues, though they may be great fodder for, for debate between uh, Christians, well-grounded Christians, you know, those kinds of things, when they're, when they're out in the public and, and we're, we're arguing these, these non-salvation issues where, where people that have not received Jesus, where these other people are hearing this, those things aren't pointing them to Christ. Pointing them away from Christ. They look at Christians that are arguing about non-salvation issues and they say they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, God is not confined to a building. He's not confined, wasn't confined to the tabernacle, he wasn't confined to the temple. 
It was in the midst of disbelieving Israel that God gave Moses the design for that tabernacle, the design for the sacrificial system. Both of those things contained patterns and and pictures of God's plan for the redemption of man by the Messiah to come. But because they had made the tabernacle, because they had made the temple, because they had made the sacrificial system and their worship of God, because they had made those things and those places the basis for their relationship with God, rather than the outflow of their own personal relationship with God, they were deaf to the message that God was trying to speak to them about the Messiah to come. Now think about that. Israel, it's from its religious leaders down, down to to the individuals, they were able to involve themselves in the tabernacle and later the temple systems of worship and yet remain just as far from God as they would have been without the tabernacle or the temple. That was because they placed the temple and its services ahead of God when God should have been first. Saying that their hearts were far from God, is, is that's not my words. Those are God's words. He said that to them. In Joel 2.13, he observed that their hearts were far from him. That scripture, I don't think we've got it in there, but the scripture says, rend your heart, not your garments, or return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. See, God's not not looking for outward show. He's concerned about the heart. And if, if if we're building our relationship with God off of programs and ministries, or even off of our opinions, or off of denominational ties, rather than basing everything else off of a personal relationship with God, then we're likely rendering ourselves deaf to the message that God wants us to receive. Verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So Stephen's now bringing his his sermon, so to speak, to a close. And he's bringing it to a close with application for the council. They were stiff-necked, meaning they were stubborn, they were obstinate. Even the undeniable truth could not make them turn. You know, this was the way of their fa- this is the way their fathers were. This is how they were. In Exodus 32:9, God said, "I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people." Stephen says they're uncircumcised in heart and ears, meaning that the thing that was a badge of the covenant between them and God was of no use, being only in the flesh, but not in their hearts and in their minds. They were proud to have received the law, and they were proud to have received the temple, yet they had not kept the law. And the one who had fulfilled the law and the prophets, Jesus, they had betrayed and they had killed. Now, as we noted before, the speech was was not so much a defense given by Stephen, but was instead a witness to the hardened hearts of the religious leaders. The history of Israel and her continued rebellion against God was meant to show them the pattern that they had of rejecting those God sent to her. The intention was to bring the council to realize that they were rejecting God's Messiah. Stephen closes by by making the point that the law was given to them supernaturally and they would not keep it. And now grace is offered to them supernaturally and they're rejecting that as well. Now as we open our own hearts to God's word so that we may find application in our lives, this chapter leads us to ask four very important questions of ourselves. First question is, am I basing my activities on a personal relationship with God 
Or am I trying to gain a personal relationship with God through life activities and ministries? There is only one way to a relationship with God, and that is through Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.5 that there is but one mediator, and that is the man Christ Jesus. We can't mediate between God and ourselves because there is nothing we could do on our own that would ever be sufficient. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Apart from Christ, we can't please God. But once we are made pleasing to God through Christ, then we can please God in our service to him. And that service to him springs forth out of our relationship with Jesus. Second question is, am I, am I allowing anything to be an idol? You know, we can make idols out of anything. We can make anything into an idol. Family, work, finances, anything we elevate above God is an idol. And just as they had turned the temple into an idol, so we can elevate a gift above its giver. We can make the church building or church ministries into an idol. We can make family an idol. Anything that we allow to come between us and God or, or to elevate an importance over God, that's an idol. You know, God never gives idols. But we might take God's gifts and turn them into idols. You know, I think with Christmas coming up, Christmas morning coming up soon, we parents will see a great illustration of this. You know, as the kids rip into the, the presents and and tear into them and forget to say thank you or, or start playing with them and start then ignoring the person who actually gave the gift. You know, we, we often do that in regards to God. You know, God provides. He, he gives us a gift of provision of some kind in our life and suddenly we place that provision at a higher level than God and we forget to magnify God and our, our, and our enjoyment of the gift. The third question is, am I rejecting grace for works? It's important that we understand that as Ephesians 2 says, we are not saved by works, but by grace through faith. That faith is not from ourselves. It's a gift of God. And so we cannot then boast in our own salvation. We cannot earn, we cannot merit salvation, but in Christ we can honor God with our lives. Colossians 1.10 says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and, and increasing in the knowledge of God. In Christ alone can we please God. But if we are relying on works for our salvation, then we aren't saved, and we cannot please God. And the last question here that we need to ask ourselves is, am I a works snob? Am I a works snob? The reality of salvation in our lives is expe expressed through works. Genuine salvation will be evidenced by works, just as James wrote that faith without works is dead. But works do not make one Christian better loved by God than another Christian. Though by our works we do store up rewards in heaven. There will be a difference in heavenly rewards. The Bible says that all works built on the foundation of Christ will be tried by fire. Some will survive to reward and others will burn. Those that burn were built using things that can not endure the test, like pride. There's a phrase that, that I see getting tossed around a lot in Christian circles these days. I've read it in books. I, I hear it in pod, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I hear it a lot in podcasts. And it's, it's a phrase that's really starting to bother me. And that phrase is true believer. 
And I'm bothered when it's used because it's often used to point out differences between Christians. I do this. I'm a true believer. That person doesn't do this. They're not a true believer. In the podcast, some of the podcasts I listen to, I, I listen to some, some messianic podcasts because I just I love that angle of things and, and learning in that way. But there's a couple of messianic podcasts that really, they, they really get on that line of, of saying, um, we observe the Sabbath, we are true believers. Wow. You know, b- and you also ignore everything that the New Testament says, <laughs> don't you? You have a problem with Paul. And we need to be careful when using that term true believer. Now, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that when, when we're making a distinction between or we're pointing out the fact that, yes, in church there are people who pretend to be saved that aren't, in fact, saved. You know, they pretend to be Christians. They're not, in fact, Christians. That's, that's fine. But when, when we're pointing out that, that we are a better Christian than this person because we do this or, or they don't do that, that's pride. You know, speaking of works being tested, there will be some very humble Christians who just simply love Jesus simply served faithfully in church, were simply good neighbors, and they'll enter into heaven and they will find themselves with great reward. At the same time, there's going to be televangelists and and celebrity Christians who wrote books about the works they were doing, who bragged about what they they were doing in interviews and things, and they'll enter into heaven with very little reward. You know, it, it talks about, the Bible talks about entering into heaven as though by fire. You know, some of these, these celebrity Christians, they'll enter into heaven and, and they'll smell like they've been purchased from a, a fire sale, right? You know, glorify God in your life, build on the foundation of Christ, but don't glorify or rate your works as being better or above the works of others. Because God, God will not reward work snobs. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him, with one accord. These are adults, remember that. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen spoke the truth in love, and they hated him for it. That was not because, or that was, that was because they were feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you've shared the gospel, you may have found that some people react harshly to it. Some even just seem to really overreact. And perhaps you've been dumbfounded by, by some of the overreactions when you've shared the gospel. Sometimes maybe it was a little over the top. I've encountered this. I remember one time in a in a counseling meeting, counseling, uh, the husband was not saved, and I, I was speaking to him about Jesus, and he stood up angrily, I stood up, and then he drew back to take a swing at me, but then walked out. You know, but, but despite what, what they expressed toward me, I was just the messenger for that. You know, their anger wasn't toward me, Their anger was toward God. And there are a lot of people who are angry with God. They're angry at God, even those who say that they don't believe in God. But many times, those who become angry at God are Christians who assume that life should be easy. 
and that God should prevent tragedy from happening to us. Then when he doesn't, we become like spoiled, angry kids who didn't get what we wanted for Christmas. In doing that, we demonstrate a misunderstanding of God's sovereign ability to achieve his best for us through or even by tragedy. Non-Christians don't have the assurance of grace without an understanding of grace. They don't understand God, and they don't understand the consequences of the law. But when the law has its work, and they are brought to their knees by it, they are able to understand God by his grace. Now Stephen, Stephen must have had a deep understanding of God's grace that he could turn and show such grace toward those who were going to kill him. It blows me away that he was able to not only forgive them, but that he petitioned God on their behalf. Now, I don't know if the language here in these final verses, I don't know if it's figurative when it's talking about, about him seeing vision of the, the Lord um, of, of Jesus at the right hand of God, standing at the right hand of God. You know, I don't know if that's, that's meant to be taken uh, literally or not. I, I take it literally. You know, but I think it's significant that Stephen saw Jesus standing rather than sitting at the right hand of God. See, most other times in the Bible, when, when it's spoken of Jesus at the right hand of God, it describes him as sitting at the right hand of God. But here, with Stephen being stoned to death, Jesus is standing. I think this demonstrates to us that Jesus is not impersonal, that Jesus is not uninvolved, but in, is instead seen to be here in solidarity with Stephen. Some have even said that Jesus was on his feet to give Stephen a standing ovation. Now, I, I don't know if that's the case, or even if they gave standing ovations then. I couldn't tell you. But I do believe that Jesus was standing in support of Stephen. And that could be a comfort to us. When we're experiencing difficulties or trials or when, when we're experiencing some measure of persecution for, for the fact that, that we are Christians. Understand that Jesus is in solidarity with us and that he's attentive. He's, he's not distant. And we end our, our chapter with these final words of Stephen which reveal to us the, the depth of peace that he had in the Lord. He was certain of God's promise, even in his death. Some would say that a Christian martyr is one who has been put to death. But I believe that all Christians are martyrs, having died to ourselves and been made alive in Christ. You know, Paul put it this way in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not death that creates a martyr. Death only reveals the martyr. You know, it's like, like writing, secret writing that's done in lemon juice on, on paper. You know, you hold it close to the flame and then the, the writing is revealed. God says in Psalm 116, 15, he says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's not exactly a cozy thought. And it's not precious in the sight of the Lord, it's the comfort of his saints, or the luxury of his saints, or the riches of his saints. It's the death of his saints. And in case you were hoping that the Hebrew word used there meant something else, it doesn't. It's mavet, it means the death of the physical body. And yeah, we can look at it from the perspective that, that God wants us to be with him. But the book of Revelation talks about our works following us. Our sacrifice is an opportunity for God to reach more people. Tragedy is a launching point. It's an opportunity. And if we're intentional about following Jesus, 
if we're not afraid to be strategic about serving God, then all doors lead to purpose. Not just the successes, but the failures, the triumphs as well as the tragedies. It's all in what we're willing to let God do with it and with us. We have a reminder here that God does amazing things through the suffering of his children. Stephen died that day, but there was a seed planted because another young man by the name of Saul, who would later be known as Paul, was present, even approving of Stephen's death. That day through Stephen, God was preparing Saul for the day that he would see Jesus on the road to Damascus. So in closing, what amazing things will God do with your life? What what amazing things will you allow God to do with your life? Let's pray. Lord, we place ourselves before you. We bow our hearts before you. We give you our lives. Lord, we ask that you would use us to glorify yourself. Lord, if we have in any way made ministry into an idol, or if we have made church into an idol, or if we have made family into an idol, or work into an idol, if we have placed anything in our lives above you, then, Father, I pray that you would correct us in that. Lord, I pray that you would be first in all of our lives. Lord, but we cannot make you first without receiving Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. There may be those here today, there may be those that are watching the live stream, there may be those that are going to listen to the podcast later, and they have not done the first work. They have not received you as their Lord and their Savior, and they need to do that right now. Lord, I pray that you would move them to do that. Your word says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It says that if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that's you, if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, wherever you might be right now, then I want you to pray along with me. Pray to receive Jesus. Don't put it off another day. Every day you put it off, your heart grows a little harder. Prayer is simply speaking to God. Just pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I am a sinner. I have sinned. Please forgive me for my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Give me the power to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for any, I thank you for all that have prayed that prayer. Again, we lift up to you those who are sick and, Lord, also those who are going to be traveling or perhaps are already traveling. Uh, we ask that you, um, uh, that you uh, help them to arrive safely uh, at their destination and then bring them back to us, Lord. We ask that you would heal those that are sick. Lord, we lift up those who are in uh, nursing homes and other places, hospitals, where Perhaps they are feeling lonely or, or, or left out or forgotten during this, this time of the year, Lord. We ask that you would um, comfort them and that you would uh, bring joy into their lives. Lord, we ask for joy in our life. We love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. So we'll pick it up next week with uh, chapter 8. And God bless you guys. Have an Hi, awesome Hi, I'm Pastor Sean, and I want to thank you for spending this time with us, learning from the Bible about God's amazing love for you and I. I hope you've been blessed by this and also challenged by today's teaching. I want to ask a favor of you. This broadcast is reaching so many with the gospel, but we cannot do it without your help. Broadcasting costs money, and it could be that God wants to use you to help us continue this ministry. We don't have anything to send to you in return other than our sincere and heartfelt thanks for partnering with us to take the gospel to the world. If you can give 10, 15, 50, maybe $100 or more, it sure would help us to continue this work of faith. You can make your donation online at calvarybirmingham.com backslash partner, or you can mail it to Calvary Chapel Birmingham, Care of Grace, Love, Hope, 225 Oxmoor Circle, Suite 801, Homewood, Alabama, 35209. Thank you so much for partnering with us, and may the Lord bless you.